been great conference, wonderful time, super good fellowship, just good conversations with many of you and uh, with Daryl and Virgil and Kyle and John and Dale showed up this morning, raptured in, so praise God for that, got a hug first thing when I got here, just uh, really blessed to be here to bring God's word to you. If you weren't here Thursday, uh, we started into Daniel 3, the whole story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you weren't here, you're just going to have to listen to it. I'm going to do a little quick review and kind of catch us up to where we were, but uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Daniel 3, where we're going to be jumping in, where we left off in verse 16. Polycarp was the pastor of the church of Smyrna. A uh, church that received a letter from Jesus, and one of the uh, letters to the seven churches, Revelation 2. And Polycarp was 86 years old. He knew the apostle John, was a friend of the early church father Irenaeus, and was arrested and charged with the crime of being a Christian, which, of course, at that time, carried the death sentence. Several tried to get Polycarp to deny his faith in order to save his skin. You know, just, just say Caesar is Lord. Or just, just offer this little pinch of incense and save yourself. Polycarp refused, saying, 86 years I have served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The New Encyclopedia of Christian Martyrs tells us more of what happened. Quote, still the proconsul urged Polycarp, swear by the genius of Caesar. But Polycarp said, if you really think that I would swear by the genius of Caesar, then you forget who I am. Take note, I am a Christian. If you want to learn the Christian faith, appoint a day and grant me a hearing. The proconsul replied, I have wild beasts, and if you do not change your mind, I will throw you to them. Polycarp said, order them to be brought. We are not allowed to change our minds from what is good to what is evil, only to change from what is evil to good. The proconsul said, as you despise the wild beasts, you will be destroyed by fire. If you did not change your mind. So Polycarp said, The fire you threaten me with only burns for a short time, and then it goes out. You are ignorant of the future fire of judgment, which is never put out and which is reserved for the ungodly. So, what are you waiting for? Do what you will. I guess I have to be burnt alive. The order was given, and Polycarp was tied to a stake to be burnt to death. He calmly told his executioners, just let me be as I am. He that gives me the power to abide the fire will grant me the ability to be untroubled as I'm burned to death on the pyre. He prayed. The wood was stacked around him and set ablaze. The fire engulfed him. And he died. He died because he was given the choice, commit idolatry or die by fire. And he chose rather to die by fire than disobey the Lord. And today, he still lives. In our first session, Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were ordered to commit idolatry or to be cast in the furnace of blazing fire. Nebuchadnezzar set up this 90-foot-tall image of himself, ordered all the leaders from all the provinces of Babylon to come to its dedication. Little did anybody know, but he was actually coming out as God, and not just God, but God Almighty. The fiery furnace was Nebuchadnezzar's incentive to get people to worship his image. Everyone obeyed. Even most of the Jews who were there obeyed. And everybody bowed down and worshiped the image, except 
in this vast crowd of people, probably up front, where they were very visible because they were three of the highest administrators in the kingdom, were three Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who did not bow down. Jealous rivals, knowing the faith of Daniel's friends, plotted to overthrow them by exposing them to the king before all in public to ensure that the king, having all this peer pressure, would have to do away with them. And, of course, they would be able to get their jobs back. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't turn a blind eye to civil disobedience of three of his top administrators, or it would just catch as wildfire and cause anarchy in his empire. So in a fit of rage, Nebuchadnezzar impudently boasted at the end of verse 15, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand, implying that he thought he was not only God, but God Almighty. This is where we left our three courageous friends who were letting their light shine before men in this very dark paganism, having resolved to obey the Lord no matter what the cost, before the king, before all the leaders, before their servants, before their gods, in public at a time when the king was lusting to be worshipped. From Daniel 3, verses 16 through 30, I want to extract seven truths to help you become lights in the darkness, resist idolatry, and give God the glory he deserves with your life by obeying his word at all costs. Since the text is big, we're going to read through it as we work our way through the text, but let's pray and ask the Lord to... Bless his word to our souls. Pray with me. Father, we come now asking that you would help us speak to us through your word. Father, we pray for a blessing. We pray for grace. We pray for life change, life transformation. We pray to be molded more from one glory to the next into the image of Christ. We are thankful that your word never returns void without accomplishing all that you have intended. Please accomplish in each of us through your spirit the work that you would do so that we can better give you glory. We need you for without Christ, we can do nothing. Help us to abide in Christ, so that we might bear much fruit for your glory. We pray this in his name. Amen. All right. Our first point. Our first point we learn from our text is know the one true God. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, calm and resolute, reply to Nebuchadnezzar's question. Okay. We do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. What matter? Well, the matter of Nebuchadnezzar's question in verse 15 and the near preceding context. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? The king's question was impulsive. It was rash. It was spoken in anger. It was delusional. Nebuchadnezzar was not a god, let alone God Almighty. This was self-evident. So they didn't need to answer that one. Everybody knew the truth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith was bold, it was unflinching, and they were resolved to obey the Lord, even if it meant being burned alive. And you can just see the faces of the leaders here. Remember, there is a gigantic crowd of people, and they're all looking at these three top officials, look at the king with the fiery furnace right there, smoking saying, sorry, we're not going to obey you. We're not going to commit idolatry. They defy the king in public. And you can just see the eyebrows of people popping up and their jaws dropping down in disbelief as these three top 
administrators to the king defy the king in public before all the leaders of the Babylonian empire. It was unbelievable. You can just hear people in the crowd whisper to each other, their, their eyes just glued on this spectacle. They are goners. They are wood for the fire. I can't believe these men. Whoa, whoa. Now I need to ask you, why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego commit idolatry? Why didn't they cave into the fear of death? Why didn't they cave into uh, fearing the displeasure of the king? Why didn't they cave into the peer pressure of all the leaders and all the servants and all the guard of all the Babylonian empire? And instead, they decided to be lights in the pagan darkness. Why? There's a simple answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew the true and living God, and it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. Their relationship with God produced faith, trust, hope in God that was so strong, they would not and could not commit idolatry in public, even if it meant a fiery death. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel 11. I want to, I want, to I want you to see this. this is a, there's a little gem here nestled in this pretty difficult passage. If you've ever studied the book of Daniel or Daniel 11, you, you basically need to rely on people who are experts in ancient Near Eastern history to get through it. Daniel is given detailed information about the various kings and powers that intersect with Israel's future, the king of the north and the king of the south, and the king of the north and the king of the south type thing. And in Daniel chapter 11, verses 31 and 32, Daniel is told about the rise of a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, um, who, like the ultimate future Antichrist, would commit the abomination of desolation in the temple, and he would relentlessly persecute the Jews. And in the apocryphal book of 1 Maccabees, we are told what Antiochus Epiphanes did in fulfilling the prophecy here we're going to look at in a second. This is what it reads, starting in verse 44 of 1 Maccabees 1. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, and he directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbath and the festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals, to lead their sons uncircumcised, they were to make themselves abominable in everything unclean and profane so that they would forget the law and change all the ordinances. He added, however, he added, whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. In such words, he wrote to his whole Kingdom. He appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the towns of Judah to offer pagan sacrifices town by town. Many of the people, everyone who forsook the law, joined them and they did evil in the land. Just like many of the Jews in our text in Daniel 3 worship Nebuchadnezzar's image. They drove Israel into hiding in every place of refuge they had. Now on the 15th day of Cheslev, in the 140th year, they erected a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. That is, they committed the abomination of desolation. This is what Daniel 11, verses 31 and 32, is talking about. Maccabees speaks of its fulfillment. Daniel prophesies it, and we read this. Forces from him, Antiochus Epiphanes, will arise and desecrate the sanctuary fortress, as we just read, and do away with regular sacrifice, as we just read, and they will set up the abomination of desolation, which Antiochus did. By smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. 
Many of the Jews were seduced, coerced, fearing death. They turned to godliness to, save, godlessness to save their skin, as we just read. Now, the last part of verse 32 is what I want you to look at. Look there. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. What enables a person to be a bright light in a dark pagan environment? Knowing God. Antiochus, a pagan king, tells the Jews to commit idolatry or, uh, or die, just as Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3 told all the people, worship me or die. Many Jews, fearing death, complied in Daniel 3. But there was one group of Jews that refused to commit idolatry. And what group is that? Those who knew their God. They displayed strength and they took action. Yes. Believer, you need to get to know God. And if you know God, you need to know him better. You can never know God too well, too thoroughly. Strength to resist temptation comes from knowing the true God in a saving way through faith in Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the grace, you have the command to be light in the world, in the very pagan darkness. Believers have all sufficient grace to shine for Jesus. As the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1a, join with me in suffering according to the power of God. How powerful is God? He, he is all powerful. He is almighty. He is omnipotent. He goes on to say in verse 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. And then he goes on to say in 2 Timothy 2, 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He, it, just in this little section here, knowing God equips believers to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, to take action, to live righteously in a pagan environment, to be lights because of the power of God, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Knowing the Lord, being born again by grace, turns children of darkness into children of light, light bulbs for Jesus. You must be born again. You must repent of your sin. You must place your faith in Jesus Christ. You must beg God to save you so that he can take your sin and your guilt upon himself, which he made a perfect sacrifice on the cross, and then give to you, impute to you, reckon to you, deposit to your account his perfect righteousness and his all-sufficient grace so that you then can live for him in the world. If you want to be a light, you need to have a relationship with God, and then you need to know God and then know him better and keep Striving to know God. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ and are born again, you receive the Holy Spirit who causes you to be born again. You are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of light. And then you have his perfect righteousness. And then you begin to shine as children of light. Believe in Jesus so you can become lights in a dark world. Know God. Secondly, know what God can do. Look at verse 17 where these three bright lights shining in the darkness answer Nebuchadnezzar before all the rulers of Babylon. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. This statement is packed with implications for old Neb. One, you aren't God. Two, you aren't God Almighty either. Three, we serve and worship the true God. And four, 
The true God is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. Daniel's friends were fully convinced that God could rescue them even from the blazing brick kiln. Their faith, their knowledge of what they knew God could do displayed itself as resolute courage to obey God no matter what. There was no doubt in their mind that God was all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, ever-present, absolutely sovereign, and could deliver them. When temptation or trials strike, we often focus ourselves on our circumstances, our suffering, the injustices, or the temptations instead of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked to God, and they found courage in looking to God in the face of crushing temptation, peril of life, the king's displeasure, and monstrous peer pressure. Let's say you're walking out to get the mail one day, and right before you get to the mailbox, this vicious pit bull comes darting after you. Rah! Are you going to call out to the Lord or are you going to yell at the dog? What is your impulse when trial strikes, when temptation strikes? What is your natural response? Will you look to the Lord or the pit bull's teeth? The apostle Peter, with all of his shortcomings, and we know he had many, that's why he's so encouraging. It's like, thank you for putting him in the Bible. <laughs> Gives us hope. When he wanted to walk on water, right? And he took his eyes for a second off the Lord. He saw the waves. He got scared. And what happened? He started to sink. And what did he do right after that? Lord, save me. That is what we need to do. Look to the Lord. Do that believer. As the psalmist says in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Listen to how Asaph mentally crawled out of his bog of self-pity and despair in Psalm 73. This is the, the changing point, the pivot point of the psalm. In Psalm 73, verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my hand. With your counsel, you guide me. And afterward, receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And he goes on to say in verse 28, As for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew God. They knew his character. They knew his attributes. They knew his faithfulness. They knew his promises. They knew what God could do, which enabled them, emboldened them to trust the Lord in the face of massive temptation. Commit idolatry or die by fire. Daniel's friends knew what the Lord said about Sarah having a child is anything too difficult for the Lord? The implied answer is no. They knew what Jeremiah wrote about in Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. The question is, do you and I believe this? Not do we give mental assent to it, but are we willing to volitionally believe so as to trust in this? When I'm discipling a new believer, I encourage them to learn about God as much as they can right up front. Read your Bible. Read A.W. Pink's, you know, little wonderful book, The Attributes of God. Read J.I. Packer's Knowing God. Read A.W. Tozer's The Knowledge of the Holy. And if they're still hungry and they're wanting more, read John Feinberg's No One Like Him, and that will satisfy them. <laughs> it goes deep and wide. 
You must not only know God savingly, but you need to know God intimately and in depth because that is what sanctifies you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God could easily deliver them from Nebuchadnezzar's hand and the furnace of blazing fire. There was no equivocation in their minds. They had already thought it through. God could deliver them from the maniacal king. Believer, know what God can do by getting to know him better through his word through conversations, by going to a good church that teaches the word. Make sure you have a deep knowledge of God. It will embolden you. The better you know God, the better you can live for him. Third, know what God must do. Know what he must do. See, God can do anything but contradict his nature. So God can't lie. God can't break a promise to you. God can't sin. God can't tempt people to sin. God can't make a rock so big he can't move it. But then there are those things God must do. He must fulfill his eternal decree formed before the foundation of the world. As Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 11 tells us, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established And I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Look at the middle of Daniel 3.17 where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego express what they knew for certain God would do. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Now, you read that line and compare it to what they just said and you're going, well, wait a second. Didn't they just said God is able to deliver us, and now he's saying he will deliver us? Like, what's going on there? Daryl talked about it a little bit last night. They didn't know for certain God would deliver them from the fiery furnace. They knew he was able, but they knew for certain that God would deliver them eternally. For that was something God must do. Believer, when God makes a promise to you in his word, he must fulfill his word. If God ever broke a promise, it would ungod him. He is the God who cannot lie, Titus 1-2. It is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6-18. When God appears who have failed and lied to you and broken his promise and he hasn't followed through, Let me just tell you what's really wrong. One of four things. One, you have wrongly claimed a promise that was never really intended for you to begin with. Secondly, you don't meet the criteria to receive the promise. Third, you are impatient forgetting that most of God's promises do not have a time stamp on them. And four, you expect God to fulfill his promise in the way And the timing of your choosing instead of his. Remember what the author of Hebrews tells us of all those faithful people in Hebrews 11. All these died without receiving what was promised on earth during their life. Yet, every one of them will receive what was promised eventually in glory. Even death cannot nullify God's promise. Remember Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, whenever you're starting to wonder, God, why, why is this happening? You know, I just don't understand. How come you aren't doing this? How come you aren't fulfilling your word? I mean, your word says this, but it's not happening. This is how you get out of that. You go to Isaiah 55, look at verse 8, and you read, 
for my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> Nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, stop there. The Hubble telescope was great, and now we have another one. What's the name of it? Yeah. It's just, man, those pictures are amazing. Now, I love it when they, they take a picture of, you know, like zillions and zillions of stars and galaxies, and then there's like a little tiny black spot, and they focus the camera on that little tiny black spot, wondering if that was like a black hole. And then they just left the camera there to do a, a, a long exposure, and then they took that little spot and they blew it up, and there were hundreds of galaxies in that little tiny speck. Okay, so here we are on this little tiny speck that's rotating with other little specks around a little star in a galaxy. And you keep going, 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 and you go through the little black hole to the other galaxies, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going, and God says, that's why you don't understand. My thoughts are there. Yours are down here on earth. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the scriptures, there are many promises of salvation and deliverance and rescue, but most of them refer to eternal rescue and eternal deliverance from the wrath of God. Worldlings live for this life. Christians live for the life to come. Unbelievers focus on health and pleasure and wealth in this life. Believers focus on giving glory to God no matter what and the glory hereafter. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew for sure that after they died, they would be alive, sinless, immortal. They would be resurrected, given glorified bodies. They would live with the Lord in glory forever, ever, and they'd end up being with Polycarp. That's the kind of salvation, rescue, and deliverance every believer is promised, and you know it will happen. It must happen because God's character is on the line. God must and will rescue every believer eternally. Four, know what you must not do. Look at Daniel 3.18. But even if he does not, even if God does not rescue us, let, us be, let it be known to you, that is from the fiery furnace, he, they knew he would, they would be rescued in eternity, but if he does not rescue us from the fiery furnace, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. First phrase in verse 18, but even if he's not, tells us that they were not going to disobey God regardless of benefits or consequences. Their faith in God wasn't mercenary. They didn't worship God for pay and perks. They knew that the Lord was worthy of all glory, honor, praise, and worship because of who he is and because of his glorious nature, but not because of the perks he gives. Satan accused Job of mercenary worship. You remember that, Job 1, verses 9 through 11. Does Job, Satan says, fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. In other words, listen, the only reason Job worships you is because you pay him. Verse 11, but put forth your hand and touch all he has, and he will curse you to your face. Satan accuses Job of being a mercenary worshiper. God says, okay, go after him, take it all away, spare his life, everything's taken away. What does Job do? He worships the Lord. Hmm. God's up there doing the divine neener, neener. <laughs> then later in Job 2, Satan answers the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. This is Satan's next accusation. Yes, 
okay, we took all his stuff away and he still worshiped you, but you know what? There's one thing you haven't taken away from him and that's his health. You take away his health and that's the big paycheck that keeps him worshiping you. However, Satan says, put forth your hand and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face because he's a mercenary worshiper. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan claimed Job, worship the Lord for health benefits. True believers don't worship the Lord for worldly wealth, for health, for prosperity and perks they receive from him in this life or the one to come. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's words, but even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. Wow. What faith, what courage, what boldness, what resolve to glorify God no matter what, what blazing light of righteousness shined before all the leaders of the Babylonian empire. They all had to pull out their ray bands. It was like, whoa. Those guys are serious. And just as the midwives refused to kill the male children in Egypt when ordered to do so by Pharaoh, Daniel's three friends would not commit idolatry. Though we are to obey the governing authorities, we cannot sin for them. Peter replied to the Jews in Acts 5.29 who ordered the apostles to not preach anymore in Jesus' name after Jesus told them to preach in my name. We must obey God rather than men. Believer, you can't sin against God to please men. Wives, you can't sin against God to please your husband. Husbands, you can't sin against God to please your wives. Employees, you can't sin against God to please your bosses. Bosses, you can't sin against God to please your employees. You must obey God no matter what. All sin is off limits to the believer. In the rare instances where two of God's commands seem to collide, obey the greatest commandment and you will have fulfilled both. Our government lets people sin. More laws are being made telling people not only that they can sin, but putting pressure against anyone who says it's a sin. But when the governing authorities tell you to sin, you must obey God rather than men. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three lighthouses. They were built on the rock of God's truth, and they stood there blazing their light before all the rulers of the Babylonian empire. We are not going to serve your God or worship the golden image that you have set up. You must respond in humility. You must respond in respect. You must respond in the fruit of the Spirit, not with snarky, stubborn, obstinate behavior. But you need to be firm. You need to be resolved. You need to be prepared then to suffer the consequences. But you must never sin against God to please men, even for the greater good. Even to save your life or the life of your children, even if it means suffering to the point of death, you must not sin. The governing authorities are all sinners. They are selfish. They don't possess all the facts. They frequently are lied to. They make fallible decisions. Some governing officials are corrupt and evil. And even if they make bad decisions, unjust decisions, evil decisions, wicked decisions, we need to realize they are held captive by Satan to do his will. That our battle is not against flesh and blood, not against people, but the world forces of darkness that are using those people as pawns to promote what God hates. Expect injustice in a fallen world. Just accept it and say, wow, those unbelievers are living like unbelievers. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to commit civil disobedience to glorify God. They must be cast into the furnace of blazing fire, as Polycarp would have said. Believer, your priority is not to save yourself. 
but to glorify God in all that you do. You must not sin. Five, know what you must expect. Look at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. And his facial expression was altered. I like the old King James on this one. His visage was altered. Don't you like that? His face crinkled up, man. He looked like he just sucked on a dill pickle. He was... <laughs> his expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three of his top officials. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. And these three men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their outer clothes. And they were cast in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And for this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, so they probably have all this wood in there and big bellows, so it's just getting hotter and hotter. And it's just like a, a funnel of flame coming out of this big stone igloo. And everybody's looking into the front of it and they're seeing the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being brought to the fiery torch of a hole coming out of the top of this giant brick kiln for this reason because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was heated extremely hot the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach Meshach and Abednego but these three men Shadrach Meshach and Abednego fell into the midst of the furnace a blazing fire still tied up still glorifying God still being lights in a pagan darkness Game over. Is that it? Game over. No. But even it was, if it was the end of their physical life, they would have been rescued from Nebuchadnezzar's hand by the Lord. Right? Yeah. The great multitude looked on in fear as the king puffs out his chest, thinking he had just proven there is no other God who can deliver you from my hand. See? The jealous rulers who plotted to overthrow Daniel's friends whispered to each other, well, we just got rid of the competition. It'd be good to have our old jobs back. Yeah, says another, and to do those things in a more profitable way like before. Christians expect opposition, expect persecution when you let your light shine before ungodly men as jesus says in matthew 5 verses 11 and 12 blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you were in good company if you're wondering, man, this is, they're persecuting me because I'm living for Christ, well, be glad you're like the prophets. John 15, 20, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Or as Luke records in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Or as the apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, is that you? Well, I hope so. It's okay to nod. <laughs> Will be persecuted. Expect persecution. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Notice, when do you rejoice? At the revelation of his glory. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory of, and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a troublesome meddler. But if any of you suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. Expect to suffer for Christ as a Christian, to shine your lights before men. Believer, you will die physically when God has determined for you to die physically. Nothing can 
kill you before God's appointed time, and nothing can allow you to live longer before God's appointed time. Your mortal lifespan is a blip on the radar of eternity. The death rate is still holding at 100% the last time I looked. (laughs) Exercise if you wish. Eat organic if you want. Take the best vitamins. Use essential oils. Get lots of exercise. Drink 10 glasses of water a day. You're still going to die. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, 27, is appointed for men to die once. And after that comes the judgment. Psalm 31, 39, verse 16, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were written all those days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. Your days are numbered. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived with eternity in view. They expected God to rescue them in life or death, so they had to die for their faith. They were going to die anyway, so why not go out in a blaze of glory? They loved the Lord. They trusted his word. They resolved not to sin. Their light outpowered the light of the hot desert sun on the plain of Dura that day. They were tied up. They were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, but they didn't compromise their faith before all the rulers of Babylon. Now, if the text just stopped here, if it just stopped here, the blazing light of their testimony would be glorious. But the text doesn't say they died for their faith and everyone went home. The text doesn't say all who watched became more fearful and gladly committed idolatry and worshiped Nebuchadnezzar's image even more fervently. It doesn't say that. Why? Because God had a plan for their suffering just like he has a plan for my suffering and your suffering. God's not up there in heaven when we go through a trial going, whoa, I didn't know that was going to happen to you, Jack. Sorry, kept my eye off you for a second, and you got into trouble, and whoa, what am I going to do about that? We all know that's ridiculous. God knows everything. He knows everything actual, everything possible. He knows the future. God lives in all time simultaneously. He's not waiting. He's there. In him, we live and move and have our being. God knows everything because he has planned everything. He is working all things after the counsel of his will. He is sovereign. Expect God to be sovereign, in control, to supply all sufficient grace with each passing moment, to supply strength to meet your trials here, to use your suffering for his glory and your good. Six, know that God will rescue you. As we have learned, God doesn't always rescue us from physical dangers in this life, but he always rescues those who are his for all eternity. As Nebuchadnezzar puffs out his chest in pride and the enemies of Daniel's friends rejoice, the king happens to glance over at the furnace of blazing fire with a proudful smirk on his face and look at verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, was it not three men cast bound in the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, oh, certainly, O king. Surely Nebuchadnezzar's heart began to pound. Surely he began to feel a little knot forming in his throat. As he remembered the foolish words he had just uttered before all the leaders of Babylon about being God Almighty, And in fear, he cries out, look at verse 25, look, I see four men loosed and walked about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Everyone's eyes switch to the furnace. Gasps of amazement come from their mouths as they see four men walking in the flames, having a fireside chat. (laughs) 
Verse 26 tells us Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. That's right. And come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. Everyone watched in fear. Nebuchadnezzar was instantly humbled and rebuked. He is now convinced by dear experience that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego serve the Most High God, and it's not him who was actually able to deliver them from the furnace of blazing fire, just as the three faithful servants had declared. And as the vast multitude looks on in utter amazement, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stroll out of the fiery furnace, probably still smiling, and God delivered them from this blazing fire, and everyone knew it. Look at verse 27. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around, and they saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on their bodies. Nor was their, their hair, their head even singed, nor their trousers damaged. I love this one. Nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. They're they're, they're like poking them. and You know? It's like... Their hair isn't shriveled. They don't smell. You know? It's like... Whoa! Complete deliverance. Perfect deliverance. Wow! But I just want you to know it doesn't always happen this way. As a matter of fact... Usually it doesn't. During the 10th persecution under Diocletian, this is 284 to 305 AD, Victor, a devout Christian, spent much time visiting the sick and weak and gave considerable money to the poor. Being so well known as a charitable Christian, he soon came to the attention of the emperor and was arrested in order to be bound and dragged through the streets, all the while being beaten and stoned by pagans along the way. His steadfastness was condemned as stubbornness and he was ordered to be stretched on the rack and tortured. Victor endured the ordeal with great courage, and when his tormentors grew tired of their work, they put him into a cell. There he preached Christ to his jailers, and three of them, Alexander, Longinus, and Felician, received Christ. When news of this reached the emperor, he ordered the three jailers to the executioner's block where they were beheaded. Victor was ordered to the rack, beaten with clubs, and then returned to prison. The third time he was examined, a pagan altar with an idol on it was brought in. He was given incense and ordered to offer it to the idol. Offended by this, Victor drove his foot into the altar and overturned it. This so enraged the emperor who was present that he ordered Victor's foot to be cut off. He was then thrown into a grain mill and crushed beneath the millstones. Believer, I ask you before God... Did Victor perish? Did God fail to rescue him? Or is Victor alive, standing in Christ's presence, blameless with great joy, shining brightly like the stars of heaven forever? Yes, we know that is true. We all know the answer. Victor lives. We will see him in glory. Though we all must die at the exact time, in the exact way of God's choosing, when all the days appointed for us come to fruition, all who know Jesus Christ, as Jesus told Martha, will live even if they die. For everyone who believes in Jesus will never die. Do you believe that? Seven, and finally... Know that God will use you. You stand up for the Lord. You become lights in this evil and perverse generation by obeying God's word, by living like a Christian, by refusing to sin. You go through many tribulations. You go through persecutions to one degree or another, knowing that God will rescue you in the end. But consider the chief end of man, which is what? To glorify God. Consider that whatever the good and sovereign God has chosen for you to endure. His grace is sufficient for you. That your trials are fewer than your sins. That you've always received better than you've deserved, even in the worst of times. And as you shine as lights, you may not be able to figure out 
how God is getting glory for himself. But you need to remember, God has no plan B. He only has plan A. It is fixed. It is unalterable. And it often requires us to suffer for his glory. But God is going to get glory for himself in your pain, in your suffering, in your trials. Look at Daniel 3, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people or nation or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. What happened there in a few minutes? <laughs> Keep in mind that all this was said by the king before all the leaders of the Babylonian empire, their guards and their servants, to the glory of God. Why? Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to suffer Whatever the consequence, they had to suffer in order to obey and be lights in that pagan darkness. The king said seven things. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, two. He declared God's ability to rescue those who are his, three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's refusal to commit idolatry was declared to be just and right, four. They were exonerated of their civil disobedience, five. The honor of God was protected throughout the empire, six. God's almighty power was recognized, seven. God's ability to save was affirmed. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, by being lights in the darkness, glorified God before all the leaders of the Babylonian empire for countless multitudes like us who still read their story today and encourage us to do likewise. The fiery furnace of persecution, of threats, of fines, of imprisonments, of losing jobs, whatever we're facing, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I encourage you, I exhort you, I plead with you to leave here determined, resolved, fixed in your heart by God's grace. To let your light shine before men so they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we are thankful for your kindness and grace. We're thankful for your mercy. We're thankful, Lord, for your word. Ah, oh, it is so good. It is so amazing. It is so marvelous. It is such a blessing. We love your law. Lord, help us to be in it. Help us to keep studying it. Show us wonderful things for our lives, for others. Help us, Lord, to be lights in the darkness. Help us to live for you in such a way that people can see that we are the children of light so that you can be glorified. Glorify yourself in us in any way you choose, no matter how painful, and help us to trust you. That regardless of what happens in this sin-cursed world, you will rescue us. And we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.